Welcome to Blockbusting, a podcast where we love to hate the movies. I'm your host, Jay Light. Joining me today, Nate Fisher. Hey, how's it going? Hey, I'm good. How are you, man? I am phenomenal. Wonderful. I'm doing great. Happy to have you. Happy to have you here. You uh, and I talked about having you on the show a while ago. Uh Your film, your film buff, film nerd. Big time snob. Love it. And this, and and this were the, you know, that's the heart of the podcast. And you hit me up with uh, quite a list of movies you want to talk about because because i i looked at like everybody that is on your podcast has pulled all these different movies and i like there's a lot of really famous ones some obscure ones and i was like well i'm gonna look at the top like the imdb top 250 see like what the like biggest one that i can like you know shit on <laughs> is and i looked and i was like well man there's like seven good movies on here like uh-huh. the imdb top 250 is just swill top to bottom and i was like well I do hate the Shawshank Redemption. Surely that's been done. It has It's the number though. one. And that's the first one. I was like, by any chance, was this like the third episode you did? Like somebody <laughs> had to have done the Shawshank Redemption. And apparently no. No. Amazingly enough, no one has touched on Shawshank Redemption. And that's why I wanted to do it. Because this movie has too much universal praise. And it just gets ushered along. It's like, yeah, number one. Sure, why not? It's great. Everyone loves it. That's the, that's the thing. It's so crazy to me. Is like... I remember, so Shawshank Redemption, 1994 American drama film written and directed by Frank Darabont based on the two, uh, 1982 Stephen King novella Rita Hayworth in Shawshank Redemption tells the story of Andy Dufresne sentenced to life in Shawshank for the murders of his wife despite his claims of innocence. Over two decades, it befriends fellow prisoners, uh, gets involved in money laundering. You got Tim Robbins, you got Morgan Freeman, box office bomb, mm-hmm. critically acclaimed got bought super cheap to be aired on TNT in perpetuity. Yeah. This is the this is the like number one in the canon of TNT Sunday afternoon classics. Absolutely. You know, like you're the last samurais of the world. Movies that like get pulled from the nineties and early two thousands just like dustbin of history. Yeah. And get a new second life. The number of times I've seen Troy on TNT. <laughs> like there's just so many movies. Like, why is this still everyone has seen this right. now because of TNT. It's always either like we like Van Helsing type oh, action Van movies. Hel- yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or schmaltzy dramas or like, like Shawshank Show Redemption. Black. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. No, so your beef with with Shawshank Redemption though, because I I never saw it for a long time. I watched it first time I ever watched it was on a plane mm-hmm. when I was in my twenties, early twenties. I, sk- I I completely missed it when everybody was like, "Oh, this is the movie." When I fig- when I discovered IMDb, I was like, "What's everyone have? What what's everyone love this movie for?" And I watched it on a plane. And I was like, "Oh, okay, okay, that's a good movie in my mind." But now this is the first time I've ever heard somebody who has uh, some detractions against it. So what's your beef? Yeah. Um, this movie has always bothered me. I remember watching it when I was like real young going like, Oh, this is nice. This is really sick. Like the, oh, it's cool how he did that mastermind thing. Like the cool escape that he did at the end. And I love how sad it is. And this is so real. And then the, the older I got, I was like, Man, so none, real. none of that's real. <laughs> that is like the fakest schmaltziest, most like, you know, they're tricking you into feeling something just like sugar. It's, mm-hmm. it's just like a, it's total Hollywood, like f- just dreck. And I was like, man, okay, so I don't like this movie. And then I thought, well, I need to go back and revisit it. So I revisited it for this podcast. And I was like, man, this is even worse than I remember it. This is like a movie that wants really hard to be like a you know, raw, searing look at what jail does to people. Mm -hmm. And then in every identical scene wants to be a cool, heartwarming, like, caper. Right. It does that in every single scene. And the the juxtaposition of doing both of those things at once is, like, disgusting. It's, like, (laughs) gross. 
Like, how can you, you can't do that. Pick one. Like, if you want it to be silly, if you want it to be like Escape from Alcatraz, that's fine. I like Escape from Alcatraz. And if you want to be like real and depressing, like, also fine. But don't straddle the line. Right. Like, because it, it, then you get into like sickly, gross territory that, that's like the, my least favorite, like, Oscar movies, like, always do that. They always like try to be real, but then like are corny and when they shouldn't be, you know? Right. And this really does seem. Like Oscar Beatty yeah. at its finest. It really it like it distills the style. The only thing that's not like Oscar Beatty about it is the fact that it's not about like a real guy. Mm-hmm. That, so they just can't like make up shit about his life to to like get wrong. But th- this one is like it's Oscar Beatty in the sense that like you are meant to leave this movie with like an understanding, at least in some small way, of how like prison works and like what jail does to people. Right. And but the overarching thrust of it is like you got to be psyched that this dude got out and like you got to care more that he got a bunch of money than about like all the horror that you went through. And it's like to juxtapose like an old man committing suicide with a guy, you know, crawling through a, you know, a, a poop tunnel to get right. out of jail is like that, <laughs> that, that one too to me is like, can we go, can we just like, talk about the suicide for like a couple more minutes you know because here's the i mean there's a lot this movie's i forgot how long it was Mm -hmm. there's a lot that they pack into this movie yeah for a movie that's based on a novella off off essentially Mm -hmm. a short story they really they get a lot they thrust so much in here there's like a there's like a superfluous 15 minute segment where morgan freeman does like a a, like narration of how like the prison industrial complex works and how prisons make money off inmates mm-hmm. that is like has the exact feel of like a Scorsese movie like describing how the mob works like, right it, it's like you know going from like montage to montage and you're like wait didn't didn't like this guy just get like violently sexually assaulted and then thrown into like a, a like a solitary confinement for a month. Right and now we're doing this. Yeah, like, how do we get? How do we get here? There's a lot of it's. You know, when I was watching it, even just just this morning, but to to prep for this, it didn't really strike me the fact that this feels like two different movies. Yeah, and now that you're mentioning it, it's like, oh yeah, there's a lot of like wacky capers and shit. Like where to the point where if they just changed the music for some of the scenes, mm-hmm. you could have played a lot of this off as a comedy. Absolutely. Like this, like uh, the thing that sticks out to me is when Tim Robbins is fighting off. Uh, Boggs and his his gang yeah. with with a rake. Yeah, right, right. Which is like that's that's if you put that in black and white and you put a jaunty piano song over it. Yeah, that's something that would have been in a Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin. Movie. Right, right. And then that movie that that scene in the movie is my least favorite of maybe all the scenes because it's the most it's symptomatic of like the movie's like real tastelessness mm-hmm. because like they. They have that scene, and then a couple minutes before it, there's the first time he gets raped by the like, you know, the the official like sexual assaulters of yeah, the jail. Yeah, they have a they have a name, right? What's the, the name of their? Oh god, the ladies, the I ladies, think? or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the first time they do it. It's oh, like, the sisters. The sisters, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Morgan Freeman's like, I wish I could say that he fought the good fight. And the camera does this move where it pans away from the action mm-hmm. and just kind of pans over to like a stack of boxes. Yep. And you just hear the violence and are meant to imagine it. And the idea that like you would show like the true, like, you know, how evil and awful and dehumanizing prison can be over the course of two hours. You do all of that, but at crucial junctures, you decide, oh no, we're going to be a little bit more, we're going to be a little bit respectful and tame, but right. do it in a way that's artful and suggests and titillates you and makes you go, oh no, what's happening to him outside of the frame? It's like, we are entertaining you and like using all the tricks in the like movie book to make you unsettled, but also like, pretending to be like austere and respectful right because that's the thing is like the movie comes out in the 90s right so in the 90s especially the way uh people handle i think the idea of prison rape yeah and and just sort of gay men societally they have they're like we have to make sure that we highlight this but we have to keep people interested and not want to show the grossness of homosexuality on screen and that's just like it's so weird to think like 
if this movie were made in even like the 2000s or now, the part where Morgan Freeman's like, they didn't put anything in his mouth that day, yeah. would have been cha- the dialogue for that would have been changed. Yo, guys, no homo. He's right. chill. You know? We uh, didn't allow anybody to put something in that man's mouth. Yeah. We it, didn't know. Because they can't, they're dancing around it because yeah, I think yeah. they feel like they had to. Yeah, right. And, and like, there's, and even when like, the 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 head sister Boggs guy gets like his comeuppance right mm-hmm. he gets his comeuppance because like Andy works in in with the guards and the guards like decide to like you know get back at Boggs mm-hmm. and then they they make him so that he's you know a quadriplegic for the rest of his life right and in the the way that's filmed and the way that scene's supposed to like make you feel like you are supposed to leave that scene going, yeah, fuck yeah, we got him. Like, that's, right. hell yeah, we got that guy back. And it's like, well, the, the, the guy that did that has killed, like, seven people. Yeah. Like, the, that, that's a multi-murdering prison officer. But they, but they keep it light by having Boggs be, like, do the grasping thing and yeah. before they pull him back in. Yeah, no, it, it, and, like, yeah, that little slickness where it's, like, that little horror movie, like, yank uh-huh. is so, like, is so, like, typical of the way this movie just pulls out the smarmiest little tricks mm-hmm. here and there to get you, like, wound up. And, like, if it had, if it had been that, like, I wouldn't have had a problem with it. If it had just been purely just smarm and just, like, Hollywood cheese... That's fine. Mm-hmm. Like, cause, cause I gotta admit, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, my, the one defense of the movie is like, I will never ever, like, not like when a, a, a caper comes together, you know, like all the little puzzle pieces fit right. in and you see how he got out of the prison. That's never not cool to me. Right. It's always sick. Any context, it's always cool to see a guy like sneaking around. Yeah. Cause it's just fun. You get, yeah. I love getting to see somebody swapping out books yeah you know yeah. and somebody and somebody sh- crawling through a shit pipe and yeah, figuring yeah, out yeah. how to make and the, things and happen the warden's like oh look at he's got the pickaxe hollowed out in the bible mm-hmm. and you're like that's right warden we got you and then it turns into like they go right back from that right into like morgan freeman's like rumination on like prison doesn't change anyone i have i have been had my entire life destroyed because the system abused me in my youth like mm-hmm. and it's like I'm I'm thinking about the poop pipe. I'm still thinking right. about that. Like, why are we why are we doing both of those things? I think there's a way in which this could have been a more successful. Like, it, it it's hard to think about it now because I don't. I think it's like one of those movies. It's very emblematic of its time. Yeah, it came out in the '90s. It, it's very much like they overstuffed it. It could have been something else if they had just held off and made it now or even made it like the very end of the 2000s instead of making it as a movie do it as a miniseries yeah do it as something where you can you can spend the time you can you can get a little grittier with it or you can make it wackier yeah and you can do like a an overt stephen king comedy which i would be totally fine with yeah yeah like a not or a 92 minute movie where like you barely know people's names mm-hmm. you get a real sense of the like dehumanization of prison right like right. If, if this was just a movie about the objective right the objective is to escape the objective is to preserve your human identity if it was just about that and you and you stripped it away of all of the you know pleasantries and like and little things where it's like men drinking a beer on the roof which i can i could talk about that scene for like we gotta we have men needs a it's a needs a little bit of suds i expected a fucking coca-cola logo to come flashing across the screen at the end of that scene it's like the way this movie is like shot and lit to be like just like the immaculate feel of an advertisement the whole way through but yeah if it had just been like if it had been fun it wouldn't have been an issue for me. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, and you're, and you're saying how it was like a very nineties object. I think that's really true, especially in the way where it's like, this is a movie that's fundamentally like predicated on a twist, right? Every nineties movie is predicated on there being a goddamn twist. Yep. It has to be some, some like, you know, usual suspects memento, like, like, Oh, see what we did there with the script. He was breaking out the whole time. Right. You thought this was a, you thought this was a heart wrenching movie about, you know, sad guys in prison. Turns out, it's actually a cool script that we wrote. Right. And especially because they keep, they drop hints to it to where they're like, oh, there's no way he could do this. The Literally from the very beginning of yeah. him setting up the scheme, yeah. when they're saying the rock hammer thing, oh, there's no way he's going to break out of prison with that. It would take yeah, hundreds yeah. of years to dig through. But, it only took Andy Dufresne 19. Yeah, and there's all these little clues here yep. and there where it's like, where it's like you you can call back to them where it's like, oh yeah, I did kind of think he was going to break out from behind the poster. Mm -hmm. It's like, it kind of rewards the viewer for like being smart and picking up on little clues here and there, which again, 
in and of itself, all of these things that like Hollywood does, they're fine in and of themselves, but when you put them in this context where you're also showing the absolute worst of the American carceral system, right. like, what's your priority here? Yeah, because that's the thing is I, I think they're, you know, watching it, there's a lot of this that I like, but there's yeah. also a lot of it that I don't think is necessary to tell the story. What do you like about it? I liked elements of uh all the stuff basically after you see andy get dehumanized yeah and in, and introduced to the prison system by basically being like raped and sexually assaulted for two years yeah you don't need really any of that i like the stuff where he he becomes friends with the rest of the these dudes in prison i like the stuff a lot of the stuff between him and red i like yeah but the problem is you have all these other guys who were supposed to care about but i can't remember their names i don't know i don't know the actors you're not you don't really care about them aside from uh, from Brooks. Yeah. And even that, I think they gloss over his whole scene and the letter doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. The Brooks sequence is one of the weirdest, grossest ones to me because they did just kind of throw it in there and you don't feel like this is someone else's story that just kind of jutted in for like seven minutes, right. which is like more than you'd expect, but not enough to warrant like mm -hmm. what his whole life is. And the way that that story is just like just pulling the strings, right? Just like making, just like twisting the knife in this poor old man, like oh, the car is almost hitting him. Oh, he can't work at the grocery store. And now he's going to kill himself. Don't right. you feel bad? And then it has another like all-time just immoral shot where he carves his name into the thing and you he, do, he commits suicide and they do it the way every movie does where you just see his feet. That's fine. It's whatever. Right. But then they pull back from the Brooks was here carving in the like in, in the ceiling of the, of the motel room and they pull back back to his dangling swinging dead body shown mm -hmm. from behind and then do a slow dissolve to the reading of the letter the idea that you can do like this kind of like this sappy slow dissolve when there's a guy it's a dead guy fucking hanging there give him a little respect it's like it, it's it's so gross to just like to just play that straight and just exploit this like guy suffering, and I don't but, care that he's not real, but you know what I mean. <laughs> but that's how you get away with putting this on TNT. Yeah, yeah. This is like it feels like this is a movie that somebody, whoever, whichever studio had decided to green like this was like, we're gonna find, we're gonna make it okay for men to cry in movies. Yes, exactly. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. this is like we need to, we need to find a way to get dudes on board with seeing this movie, which is why, of course, it makes so much sense that the 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 thing that catapulted this movie to being super popular is it airing on cable constantly yeah yeah that's it's like designed to be broken up and watched in chunks and and because here's the thing about it I, i'm 100 percent agree with you that it is like it's really schmaltzy and it really pull and it really is very like puppeteer you yeah. can see the strings but goddamn, there's something about this movie that i was watching this morning and i was like trying to write and take notes mm. and i just couldn't look away like i kept getting sucked in and then i would notice like 30 minutes had passed yeah and i was like there's i can't i can't not be sucked in and captivated by this movie i think that's what i think it's because there's a fundamental like craftsmanship to it right there's mm -hmm. a fundamental like this script is is like for all of its like abundances and like and like liberties that it takes with these stories and the fact that it is so long right like it has a tightness to it it's it's building to that third act twist like there's there's Everything in it has like little dramatic ironies where it's like, oh, he's got that little like a crocheted Bible verse on the wall that's going right. to come back in act three. Or like he's got like, oh, he's going to make friends with this guy and then this guy's going to help him out later. That kind of thing. Right. And or they or they'll even have the moments where they're like, ah, you know, you don't you know, everybody's innocent in this prison. Yeah, exactly. And then he says it then 15 years later and it's like, oh, I get it now. And that's what it does. It flatters your intelligence. Right. It makes you feel like smart for picking up on these things. Right. But more than that, it makes you think, oh, the movie is smart for doing that. Right. Like you, you pick up on it and like, that's a smart movie and I'm smart for getting that. And then it's also like a, a very like pretty movie and i say this in a kind of like pejorative way where it's like this movie is like too handsome the way it will like crane o over these dead right. bodies and the way that it will like just sort of like when the guy gets shot and they like tilt up to like show him getting shot from behind by the guard it's like it's like have a little respect for the dead you but know what i mean the beauty you have like roger deakins who's uh, arguably i think the greatest cinematographer currently working yeah you have him lensing this movie yeah you have frank darabont who's obviously a very competent 
you know, workman director who can, who figures out how to like make this stuff work and, and it works and it feels like it's crafted well, but then you step back and you're like, what the, what the hell, what happened? Yeah. How did, how did I allow this to affect me this much? It's, but that's the thing. It's like, it's all the invisible little, like, it, like they're trying to make the, like the strings as invisible as possible to mm-hmm. make the strings that they pull on you to get you to cry. Like they try to make you like not know that they're getting them on you. Right. Because then, then you feel cheated. But I, I have never felt like more like cheated towards like tears and then in this movie than in any other I've seen. Mm -hmm. And I I liked your point about how like it is a movie for men to cry Yeah, because like at the end of the day, like you, the men are allowed to cry because you go at the end, Oh, this guy is still the fucking man. Right. Like I'm, I'm crying, but um, only for a guy that is a badass and, right. and did the cool shit and, it, and and was like, got one over on the guys I didn't like and he beat those guys' asses. Right. You know, it's like, that's like that's when you're allowed to like cry that he gets to go hang out in Mexico. If he actually got like fucking ruined by a system and was powerless to fight it and was like ultimately betrayed by uh, the inability of himself and his inmates to form like a solidarity against a system that destroys them, which is, I would argue, probably more accurate to most prison experiences. Right. People wouldn't like that. They would find it pitiful. Right. They would find him like, oh, this guy is like, this guy's weak. This guy's sad. I can't cry at this guy. This guy's just a bummer. Right. There's a way higher likelihood that prison is going to wind up for somebody the way it does in The Night Of than it does yeah. in Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah which I, I, don't, I saw like two episodes of that. Night of, is, Night of is good, but it's bleak, man. Because yeah. it really, it's just, you watch... Uh, oh fuck! What's the act? What's the what's the actor's name in that? Oh, um, Riz Ahmed. Riz Ahmed. Is, is that yes. His name? Yeah. You watch him just go. He like he just goes through it, and like he gets demoralized. And he has to go through all this prison shit, and it's there's nothing cute about it. That's the thing with Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, is it's yeah. cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's it's supposed to be. I don't know. There's like whimsy to it. You don't leave you with know? as bad of an image of prison as you should from this movie. Yeah. I think there's another element of this and I haven't talked about this aspect of filmmaking specifically on, on the podcast yeah. in a minute because it hasn't really occurred to me until this episode. The music. Yeah. God, really dude. like you it's, got, it's too, it's too Disney-fied. It's awful, man. It's weird, man. Yeah. It's so, it, cause I, you know, music obviously is very powerful in, in filmmaking yeah. and changing the soundtrack to a movie and changing the, the score to a movie can really affect the way you watch it. And I think that picking Thomas Newman for this, who's doing all these, you know, if you don't know a Thomas Newman score, if you watch the scene from American Beauty where the bag is flying around, that's the oh. that's the iconic Thomas Newman the, song to me. It was between this and American Beauty for right. movies I wanted to talk about on this podcast. Right. <laughs> but that's the thing. It's like Thomas Newman is the king of uh, of making songs that are going to be like, yeah, this is going to make him. We're going to make him feel something with yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And he does that, and you can really see, I think, out of all of the strings that operate mm. this movie – the music is the thing that really cements like, oh, we're going to really get you going. We're going to yeah, get you. We're going to stoke yeah. your emotions. Yeah, music really like really warps scenes way too much. And, like I love old movies. Like I love classical Hollywood. And like there are some great composers that worked in classical Hollywood. But at the end of the day, like most of those movies, as amazing as they are, had horrendous music. Mm-hmm. And this is very much in that vein where it's like, hey, you know what would make this scene better? 500 violins. Right. Wouldn't it be great if there were just a chorus of heavenly angels all the time, constantly instructing you what to think and feel about everything you saw? There's no room for ambiguity. There's no room for like... Uh, a shared understanding with the characters. There's an, only an understanding of what is imprinted on you in a moment to moment basis. And that's why I find the movie so smarmy. I think because the music is a big tell of the intentionality of the artwork. Like mm-hmm. the effect that it has on you is we want to tug you, we want to rip you around and we want to manipulate you. And, and, and we want to feel we, as a, as the people making this are superior to you, the viewer, you are you are pawns in our little game. Right. It's manipulative, but not in a way that make that that upon reflection is anything other than hollow. Yes. Like uh, it's it's got no actual real, really no substance. Yeah. If it's manipulation that recontextualizes the behavior of the characters or puts it in a context where you might learn something new about them, like that manipulation 
is what great movies do. But bad movies just underscore the exact same point with every single aspect of their production. Like, mm-hmm. they're always like, like this is a scene where Andy does something cool. You're going to like him for doing this. Or this is a scene where Andy does uh, learns that it's okay that his wife died. And you're going to be cool with that, too. Right. No lingering regrets. No feelings of, like, I need to, like, reckon with this part of myself that thought this. It's always... In, out, this is what you're supposed to feel. Right. I think that if they had streamlined the film and made it focus so much more exclusively on the relationship between Andy and Red and how Andy and his behavior and his attitude change the way Red looks at his life and his experience in prison, then I think that that it becomes more effective and still can do all of the things that it's actively doing without feeling so bloated. And without having all this unnecessary stuff in there. Yeah. It's you, it's just too much. You mentioned how like bad like the first half hour is. The first half hour is like woeful when that like fat guy gets beat up and like killed. Yeah. And it's like it's like you throw him in there just to kill him. You throw him in there just to be a kind of like a pathetic sacrificial lamb Mm -hmm. where the rest of the movie is like, well, don't be like that guy. That guy was a fucking loser. I'm going to be better. I'm not going to cry my first night in the clink. It's like, well, but but, but that that guy just died. Like, don't you care? Like, don't don't we like, don't we want to know more about the people that like, are the worst off from the prison system? Right. Don't we want to know like where the, the the pinpoint of the horror is rather than about this one guy who managed to like kind of skate around it because he happened to be good at forging tax documents? Mm-hmm. Like that's another contrivance that I didn't like. Just the fact that it's like <laughs> this is a movie where this guy has a particular set of skills that right. can just get him out of jail like whenever he needs it and that's like but then he's in another prison of his own creation yeah man. but then he has to learn to forgive himself <laughs> and learn to move on and it's like okay we we uh, he's gonna live a perfect life at the end of this we know that like, right why doesn't he well, can he have demons like let him have some fucking demons no he has to have a perfect fucking life on a beach in mexico right like i don't i i just i loved i i i love when characters have actual problems right we don't need the Shawshank Redemption we need the Shawshank tragedy we need this movie to like not have a happy ending or we need you know just escape from Alcatraz and it's just Clint Eastwood I'm gonna bust out of Alcatraz and Mm -hmm. that's all it is for an hour and a half which is fucking sick yeah or it could be really sad one of the two here's there's I've been looking at some of the notes that are on Wikipedia uh about this first of all my favorite quote just about this from the analysis section. There's a lot of analysis oh, about Wikipedia this Wikipedia analysis section is awesome. Yes. You get some real good symbolism there. The guys really get into the metaphors. A lot of Christian metaphor, a lot of oh, messianic yeah. stuff. They don't miss it. They don't miss a thing, those guys. Those this, Wikipedia especially, guys. Listen to, listen to this cogent analysis. Andy and Red's relationship has been described as a non-sexual story between two men. Just applause. Just congratulations well, you know, for that. Figuring that one out. I mean, whoever wrote, yeah. whoever, whoever did that, who did this? Thirty-four. Uh, this is from uh, the Hollywood Reporter, Kimberly Nordyke. Good job, Kim. Great you job, really Kim. got to the to the meat of THR. it's a non-sexual story. They don't let anyone write for the trades, you know. You no. got to be good. You got to be real solid. Yeah. <laughs> what else we got in there? This film, it's uh, the friendship is not built on a, conducting a caper, car chases, or developing a relationship between women. That's from Mark Kermode. Mark Kermode. Oh, that fucking clown. I know, right? A bozo. That's the thing. It's like. I would I I don't like I said I don't mind the relationship I think it's the 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 heart of the movie I yeah. think it's the thing that is the most effective yeah but it could have been fun if we had more caper if, Ab- if Andy had not been the only one who was in on the caper if Red was in there too yeah god damn this would have been a fun movie let's there, have a Stephen King comedy yeah I'm gonna plug my favorite prison break movie of all time is a French movie from like the 50s called Le Trou and which is French for the whole and it's about seven guys. And you know almost nothing about them, but it's all about the little tiny shared glances and ways that they just do the little, little gestures here and there to mastermind this incredible plan to break out of the prison. Mm -hmm. And it's all their little behaviors and all the little tiny things they do to make this impossible caper work. And you just kind of like fall in love with the rhythm and like the way that they kind of like go about their daily business of trying to get out. And that is like what is cool about Shawshank Redemption. Like the the like group dynamic as part of a overall plan. And it's not schmaltzy at all. 
it is also, and like this is kind of gets onto like the fact that like the relationship between Red and Andy is like a little bit underwritten there. Mm-hmm. Where it's like the whole La True is the gayest movie I have ever seen that doesn't have two men <laughs> kissing. It is literally called The Hole, and it's like so much just like guys touching each other in really confined spaces. And like a little bit of like that, a little bit of like actual like danger in that is like can go a long way and not like in a sort of moralizing like oh these guys are gonna like rape you in like the broom closet kind of way right like actual like hair development but i'm rambling but that's the it's there's so many missed opportunities but it's not i don't think it's for lack of desire to go down those avenues i think it's just because frank darabont knew he was like i'm gonna make this specific movie Yeah. yeah 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 and I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. And again, I'll, I'll say it again. This movie, it worked on me. It's a winning formula for a reason. It, pull, it pulled itself yeah. off. Yeah. There's a reason why this is still the most nominated Stephen King adaptation for, yeah. as far as Academy Awards go. I think it got seven nominations. Yeah, seven Academy Awards. Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Cinematography, Best Editing, Best Sound Mixing, and Best Original Score. And it lost most of those to the worst movie of all time, Forrest Gump. Yep, it lost every, I think it lost every single one. Uh, Yeah. Because Forrest Gump, and these are the other movies nominated for Best Picture that year, by the way. Four Weddings and a Funeral, Pulp Fiction, and Quiz Show. Yikes. It lost to... All of those, but most especially Lost to Forrest Gump. Yeah. Forrest which is a which is a fucking travesty. Yeah, that movie is gross. Because Forrest Gump is another movie where you can see the strings at work in it, but oh, in yeah. an even grosser way. They're way sloppier than about in the Shawshank strings. Redemption. They don't bury right. the strings. Yeah, because like I guess uh, yeah, Roger Deakins is the difference, honestly. Because there's so many moments in, in Shawshank, and I and I'll I'll speak to Deakins being cool here. I, this is the thing that's good about it. Like they really do a good job of making it like casually beautiful, where it's like like this movie like has a very sumptuous sort of like tracking shot across the prison as all the inmates are walking in single file line down to to like the mess hall or whatever and all these little things are like oh man this is beautiful and really working on me and you can really feel the authenticity i don't feel that but i see how it does that like Mm -hmm. i I can respect i can respect the craft if i think the craft is at its core immoral right and gross um but yeah i can respect that about it you can respect that and that's the other i think a lot of it is that shawshank is a much cooler movie if you're looking at it from the sense of like the, the force gump is not going to get played and talked about for any great length because it's supposed to be just like fun and crowd pleasing. Yeah. In a way that Shawshank at least is like grittier. It's still yeah. a fucking gigantic crowd pleaser and it's right. designed that way, but it's R rated yeah. as opposed to PG 13. Tim Robbins is just a, a regular guy and Tom Hanks is Boy, that performance, uh, mm-hmm. history does not look well upon that one. No. That's, that's, whoo, Oh, tough. boy. <laughs> tough one. There's so much about the Shawshank Redemption that I look upon the, like, I, I watched this movie a couple times and I'm just like, I, you, it, it worked. It yeah. It really yeah. worked. And that's, that's, it says, you know, I, I, I really like the way you put it where it's a, it's a movie that makes you feel like you're smart. It's a, it's a smart movie for dumb people. It's yes. a movie for dumb yes. people to feel, to watch and think, that's oh, why. I'm smart. I get this movie. That's why it's the number one movie on the IMDb list because all those movies that are on there, you look at all of them, they're all about like doing tricks. Like mm-hmm. most of those movies you look at them like, like uh, your Christopher Nolan movies, like Fight Club, yeah. stuff like that. They're all about doing things on a technical level that you notice and go, oh, this movie does technical things that I like. It must be genius. Right. Now, it doesn't matter that those technical things are obvious and like, you know, it takes you one year of like film studies to like really suss all those out Mm -hmm. but it's just like those are the ones that the most people notice so if you want to feel smart about watching movies watch movies like Shawshank Redemption because they will make you feel smart on a very facile level right I like movies that aren't perfect like it's better to me when a movie is like imperfect with real feeling than perfect with no real feeling right because you can because you can see the artifice in it yeah yeah, I'd rather have something that makes you feel something but is a little bit jagged yeah exactly yeah 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 I wanted to yeah like that's I like I like movies that like 
don't do as unanimously well because they're not as unanimously regarded as good. And people are going to say, I'm just a contrarian for that. And yeah, duh, of course. Right. Someone's got to be. Oh, well, yes. Film snobs, I feel like, are more likely to be contrarian anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, That's it's, how it's we do. All, it's all we have. Yeah. Like, we watch these movies alone. Like, there's no <laughs> there's no joy in watching movies with people. Yeah, it's it's all we have is... is uh, trolling right exactly yeah. what's your favorite movie this year uh irishman irishman I'm happy to go with the herd on this one there happy to go with the consensus it is like stag- i cried so fucking much and you did you cry in a way where it felt not like uh shawshank crying yeah. oh i know i was manipulated but it was like i know i was being manipulated by guys who had been like working on this idea for like 50 years the actors scorsese the people he worked with like the genre that he worked in has all kind of been building up towards this moment mm-hmm. like the way the way it kind of like have you seen it? No, not yet. Okay. Just the way the whole last hour defies the genre convention and just really drags you kicking and screaming into a life you didn't want to be a part of. And it's so harrowing to sit through and to ha- offers you very little in the way of hope. And I and I really felt like devastated and alone. And uh, yeah, it's amazing. It's fantastic. Can't wait to watch it. So yeah, far, yeah. my top one of the year is Parasite. I think. Oh, uh, yeah. Same problem with Parasite with Shawshank. It's too, it's too, uh, too smart, too... Uh, too much of a contraption, right? Everything fell into place just so for me. And I like Bong Joon-ho. I love his movies, but it would have been better if it was worse. Interesting. Yeah. I think we'll we'll, we'll have to talk about that yeah. maybe, maybe another time. Yeah, Because right. we're wrapping it up. Yeah, right. But, man, I think Parasite does it for me. But I can't wait to see The Irishman. Everybody's talking about how great it is. I got to just sit yeah. down and, and carve out that three and a half hours. Give it hours. one sitting. Just really just hunker down and go through it. Yeah, it's I'm just, not going to do that mini series bullshit no, that people no, no, keep no, 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 poking no. around way, about. That's a way to neuter its impact on you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I want to turn be, great film into television. I want to have it feel all at once. Yeah, absolutely. You That's gotta, the way you got to do it. It feels long. It's a long one. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, absolutely. I'll sit through a long movie. Yeah. I sat through two and a half hours for this. I sat, and I just sat, I'd sat through a three hour movie the other day because I'm doing an episode on Scarface. I watched a 12 hour movie one time over the course of two days. Uh, it's like an old French movie from the 70s and it's like eight parts and like, <laughs> it, it's good. Those pesky Franks. I know. Yeah. Oh, Ugh. wait, before we do go, I have to say this because my mother will listen to this. My say mom it. lives in Memphis and she said that she saw someone do a show in Memphis. She went to a comedy show and it turns out that was you. And uh, she wanted me to tell you that you were really good and she really liked your set. Oh, tell your mom. I said, thank you. She's she will listening. Listen to this. She will thank definitely you. listen to this. Thank you, Ms. Vesher. I appreciate it. That's yeah. what. Oh, God. What a time. Yeah. What a spot. Well, Nate, thanks for coming on, man. Dude, I thank appreciate you. For you me. Uh, we get to talk about some some man shit. That's Ugh. right. I feel just very the man- idea of manliness. Yeah, just to bust out. No prison can hold me. No These bars can't hold me. Down. I would bust out of the prison too. Better get busy living or get busy dying. That's Fuck what yeah, I I'm say. Going to Mexico. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, where can the listeners find you? You can find me on Twitter uh, at Nate Media Good. Instagram same handle. I do a lot of uh, impressions of uh, Quentin Tarantino yeah, on there, there you go. Uh, and other things like that. And uh, you perform at, uh, with a sketch team at the Pack yeah, Monthly, yeah. right? A sketch team called Brutus at the Pack Theater. We had our first show on Wednesday. Went pretty good. I heard, th- heard good things. Yeah. Come check that out. You can find me at Diet J on Twitter and Instagram, jlightcomedy.com for show dates. Uh, and if you like the show, tell a friend, leave a review, subscribe, join the Facebook group, the Patreon, all that good shit. You know what to do. Thanks again, Nate. Oh, thank you for having me. This has been Blockbusting. Go see something good for a change. <laughs>